Hi, welcome back. Um, this is part two of the cosine tutorial on what can we learn about the brain from recurrent neural networks. So in the first lecture, we saw how randomly connected nonlinear RNNs function. So we saw how randomly connected nonlinear RNNs can produce spontaneous activity that is rich and ongoing. And that's what you see here in this one example neuron that I've plotted as a function of time. Now, when inputs go into these networks above a certain critical input amplitude, we saw how networks like this can quench their intrinsic variability and become entrained to the frequency of the drive. And so we saw this phase transition and explored its various properties in the randomly connected regime. We can also visualize these types of dynamics by looking at a population activity plot, like you see here, where I've shown you the activity of a few hundred units as a function of time in the spontaneously active case, as well as a case in which the intrinsic chaos is quenched and the network pays attention to the external drive. Now, it's useful to also visualize these types of population dynamics with something that, the, that our experimental colleagues will also be able to use with the with data that they collect. And that brings me to the concept of state space views. So a state space view like this is just um, a system, a coordinate system derived by applying di uh, dimensionality reduction techniques to visualize dynamical motifs. And so in the spontaneously active case, this, um, the activity of the entire network can be seen to traverse some kind of trajectory in the state space. Now, in, in the case when the network turns off it in, if its intrinsic variability and becomes entrained to the frequency of the drive, the same state space view becomes one where you can see this periodic cyclic oscillatory kind of behavior. And so what we want to do now is to enrich our theory, right? We've been writing down the theory of cognition as dynamics. We want to enrich that with the idea of the geometry of the, of the dynamics. And so where are we, right? We looked at the case of nonlinear RNNs with random connectivity. We saw that without inputs, we got fixed points which were trivial or activity just decayed to zero, or we got chaotic activity from this. We saw how phase transitions can make the state of networks like this more reliable. So are we done, right? What we want to be able to do is to capture the richness of the brain in terms of doing more than just generic patterns of activity. So we want to be able to get this network that we've, bu we've built to do tasks, to have some kind of specialized properties that will allow us to make a tighter connection with experimental data. And so what we want to do is to get away from random recurrent interactions, and we want to train these networks to do something. So what we want to do is to have them perform a function that is brain-like. We want them to be able to perform them and get reliable and repeatable patterns of activity from them. We want to be able to eventually discover mechanisms from them. And we're going to be looking at a few examples where this has been done quite profitably. So what are a few approaches for building and training neural network models in neuroscience, right? So one of the ways of doing this would be for you to imagine how a certain task is to be performed. Imagine the mechanism and then dial that up into the circuitry. And that's how you build a model. This would be like a normative way of constructing these models. And indeed, there are examples where such a thing has been done. And very clever work has, has, um, has allowed us to make progress on this. However, these have been restricted to a few specific kinds of tasks. So when you're starting to think about more naturalistic behaviors or richer experiments, then it's harder and harder to conceive of a mechanism a priori. However, what we can do is to leverage the explosive advances we've had in machine learning. And that involves training recurrent neural network models, like the ones that we've been talking about so far, to do those tasks. With, through different training procedures, we get networks to do these tasks, and then hopefully reverse engineer them and try to understand how the biological circuitry might have accomplished the same. And there's a few different um, categories of training procedures where this has been used profitably. And I've listed only a few of the numerous labs that have worked on this. Now, there's other ways in which we can you know, use these types of training procedures and use neural network models as hypotheses test beds. 
or to generate new hypotheses, or even train network models to match neural or behavioral data collected experimentally directly. And People, including um, those in my lab, have used these types of approaches. And I'm going to be telling you how we do these things. So there are training algorithms to, for RNNs to perform something brain-like. So this is the equation that we developed together in, at the end of the first lecture. We have a nonlinear RNN that can be connected through initially through random um, connectivity weights. Now, in order to train networks to do something brain-like, one common approach is to attach an output unit to it. So one of the ways of doing this would be just as a linear readout. So here is an output unit that I've attached to the schematic neuron here. And the output of that neuron is z of t. And that will vary over time as just a linear sum of everyone's firing weight within this network. Now, training algorithms can change the readout weights that take these uh, firing rates and produce the output. And they can also train the recurrent weights within the network. There's two main categories of training algorithms for RNNs if we want to get them to do something specific. There's gradient-based methods or target-based methods. In gradient-based methods, as you've seen before, there's an output unit. And the changes in the recurrent weights are updated by following a gradient, which is an error that is computed on the output directly. In target-based methods, in contrast, you don't need an output unit because every unit within the network can have a specific target. So that's what you see here, right? The learning rule is updated by a linear function of the error, which is the, which is the difference between the firing rate of everybody in the network and a set of targets that can be derived directly from experimental data, as you see here, or in a category of learning methods uh, which come from teacher forcing, they can come from an auxiliary network that automatic that only during the process of training produces the right targets in order to change the recurrent weights. And one of your TAs, Brian De Pasquale, has done some beautiful work on um, work in this category. So here are a few examples. Um, in which these types of learning rules have been used profitably to make discoveries. And there's many other examples, but I'm only picking a couple here to show you. So one is from this paper from Valerio Monti and David Susillo, where they train a recurrent neural network model to flexibly switch between a motion integration or a color integration task. And they compare it to empirical data collected while monkeys are performing the same task. And by reverse engineering this model that was trained to do this task, they were able to infer that the mechanism for, for executing this task involved two different kinds of integration, one for motion and one for color. Here's another example from Devika Narayan and Wang from um, Mehrdad Jazayeri's lab, where they showed that a recurrent neural network model could make predictions about how cortical regions could flexibly generate responses with varying speeds. And here's another example from Abigail Russo and Mark Churchland, along with uh, Larry Abbott, uh, where they trained a neural network model to do something similar to what a, what a non-human primate does in a cyclical behavior. And this really tackled a fundamental problem in neuroscience, which is when you're recording activity from a brain region, how do you know if this activity is intrinsically generated or inherited from someone connected to it? So they developed this powerful metric called tangling that could get at some of these mechanistic questions. So where are we? We're enriching our theory of cognition as dynamics. We're developing a program in which cognition can be understood by looking at dynamical motifs, as well as the geometry of these motifs in state spaces. We've talked about how we can train nonlinear RNNs to do something brain-like. We've seen how recurrent neural networks can be flexibly used to perform complex tasks. We've seen how models like this can exhibit rich, yet repeatable dynamics through the process of training. Therefore, we can get the best of both worlds, where the dynamics are rich, yet reliable enough to get performance that's comparable to experimental data. And we are starting to see how they can be used for mechanistic discovery, or in other words, getting, to, getting at quantities that you cannot get at trivially from measurements alone. So what we're trying to do with, this, with these types of intuitions is to connect our theory of cognition as dynamics with understanding how these dynamics unfold in state spaces. 
by looking at the geometry of these dynamics. So we're in this era of unprecedented technological advances in neuroscience, where our experimental colleagues are collecting activity from larger and larger portions of the brain, collecting these massive data sets while animals are performing different functions. The one observation that has been made is that the dynamics that are relevant to a cognitive behavior or function under a variety of different experimental conditions seems to occupy a smaller dimensional subspace within the full n dimensions that are available. And these neural manifolds are often described or shaped by the covariance between the outputs that are recorded in these, in these experimental conditions. So one question that remains unanswered is what are the inputs that are driving this covariance? Right, the inputs that are driving this covariance can also be not just external inputs like we saw before, but really brain-wide interactions among interacting brain regions brain-wide. Right? So brain interactions shape these neural manifolds. And so here's what you see in this little cartoon where, I've symbolized, where I have schematized three such um, areas in blue, yellow, and red. And there's a few quantities that are inaccessible from measurements or from current methods of, um, of inferring these types of neural manifolds. So what are the inputs to each neuron from within and across brain areas? What is the direction of these interactions and the effect of common inputs? So what I mean by that is are area A and B affecting area C unidirectionally, or does area C project to area A and B reciprocally? And also, how do you scale these current methods of looking at covariance between, between active neurons to more than two areas at a time? So to get at these mechanisms that are impossible to get at from measurements alone, one approach is to build multi-region RNN models. And they will be constrained directly by neural and behavioral data. They'll be built exactly like I told you before, except the target functions for training these will either come from idealized ground truth style toy models, or they can come from smaller brains where we have a lot more access, such as a larval zebrafish system, which I'm going to tell you about in a second, or they can come from other types of data, such as from mice, from behaving macaques, or from humans. What we'll do after we build these models and train them to match data from these different nervous systems is to analyze them using different methods, uh, some specially developed for this purpose, as well as some similar ones such as those used in recordings, including some methods that we saw in a couple of references before. And we will be able to infer from them circuit mechanisms that are impossible to get at through measurements alone. And in my lab, we've been working on these approaches uh, quite extensively. So let me tell you about one example in which our approach of building neural network models and training them to match data directly and then reverse engineering them has led us to make us mechanistic discoveries that couldn't have been obtained experimentally alone. And this is in collaboration with Carl Dizerot's lab at Stanford. So Aaron Andelman, a talented postdoc in Carl's lab, did the following experiment. So you know, larval zebrafish are head fixed and then exposed to a slight electric shock over a long period of time. So when the shocks first come on, larval zebrafish will vigorously whip their tails to avoid the stress. However, they're head fixed and the shocks keep coming anyway. So over time, the fish lapse into a state where they don't struggle anymore, where they're not whipping their tails anymore. And that state is called passive coping. So there's two behavioral phases here. And what we've done here is to take the tail whip velocity and average it over different fish and plotted that as a function of time. In pink is the duration of the behavioral challenge period. In black is the average tail whip velocity over time for control fish. And in blue, that for shocked fish. And you can see those two phases quite clearly. When the shocks first come on, there's this elevation in the tail whips that you see in the blue trace over the black. And over a period of time as the shocks build on, the animal perceives this as persistent and inescapable stress and lapses into the state called passive coping, in which you see that the shock, um, where in, in the shocked fish, where the tail whips fall much below the velocity of the control fish. Now in Carl's lab, they also express nuclear localized GCAMP, which means that we're able to monitor cellular resolution activity in the whole brain of these fish during this, um, during this entire experiment which lasts several minutes. 
And so we're able to visualize electrical activity in the brain while this animal is experiencing these two, these two um, behavioral phases. So one of the things we want to be able to do is to extract mechanisms and principles from smaller brains with more access. The larval zebra fish system is perfect because we can see right through it, and experimental colleagues can monitor essentially every unit in the activity of uh, every unit in the awake behaving larval zebra fish. And we want to be able to say, can we get something about mechanisms or principles from these nervous systems and then scale the same approach to larger brains where we have less access? And we want to be able to identify things like similar or divergent mechanisms. The other reason larval zebrafish are interesting to us is because they have interesting homologies with the mammalian system, particularly in the mouse, where the neurobiology of active coping and passive coping have been studied extensively, as you see in this list of references here. So I'd like to draw your attention specifically to two nuclei, the habenula and the raphae, which seem to be um, present and active in both of these nervous systems. But before that, one of the questions we get to ask as computational people is to be able to say, is our approach of training networks directly from the outset with experimental data, is that approach going to be able to get us any closer to identifying circuit mechanisms or fundamental organizing principles across these nervous systems, as well as being able to identify key divergences? Let's return to the larval zebrafish case. So there's a couple of patterns that came out of just the measurements. And so what were they? So the main neural findings or from the population activity that was collected in this nervous system was a steady increase in the habenula as a function of time. So what you see here is the calcium fluorescence averaged over multiple animals in shocked fish as well as in control fish in the habenula as a function of time. The dashed line that you see is a time at which the shock started to come on. And you can see that in shocked fish that you can see in blue, there's a ramping up of the activity in the habenula as a function of time. Concomitantly, experimentalists observed that there was a suppression in the activity of the raphe, which is a region that is downstream of the habenula, and if you recall from a couple of slides ago, is also conserved in mouse, uh, mouse brains, which helped us ask a question like, can we connect this to studies in other nervous systems? So the two neural findings from the experimental data alone are that with shocks, there's a steady increase in the activation of the habenula, as well as a concomitant suppression in the activity of the raphe, which is known to be downstream of the habenula. So the story that we were trying to build towards, or the theory we were trying to write, is to say bad stuff's happening and the habenula ramps up its activity, projects to the raphe that dumps serotonin into the system and says, I, cavalry's here, I hope you feel better. However, since the stress that the fish are exposed to is persistent and inescapable, the fish don't feel better, someone has to be shutting down the movement. So what we started to look for was look brain-wide and ask the following question. Is there a cortex in the zebrafish responsible for shutting down movement? So in order to answer this question, we will be building a multi-region recurrent neural network model. And we do this in two steps. In the first step, we take the framework that we had built before, which is a single module recurrent neural network, and we will wire multiple recurrent neural networks together to construct a multi-region RNN. And in the schematic here, I'm showing you uh, a three-region RNN, where in blue you see a region A that is given by RNN A, a region B given by RNN B, and a region C that is symbolized by RNN C. Now, what we know from, the, from looking at the building blocks that we've arrived at so far is that you understand every, the behavior of single module RNNs by looking at the activation of everybody inside this network and by looking at the strength and direction of the recurrent interactions between them. And those are succinctly captured by this recurrent interaction matrix J that I've shown you here. Now, in the multi-region RNN, the case is similar, except the multi-region RNN has sub-matrices that can capture both within area interactions, as you can see highlighted here, as well as inter-area interactions, as you see highlighted here. And this becomes powerful when you start to look at the difference between within-region connectivity versus between-region connectivity. 
The second thing we'll do is to take the activity of the model units in here and train them to match neural data directly. So we will be taking the approach of a training algorithm that is target-based that we've seen before. And in the, in the beginning, when the activity of the unit, as given by this red trace here, each unit's activity is trained to match a target that is derived directly from calcium imaging data in the larval zebrafish. And as I, as I taught you before in the target-based um, learning rule description, the learning error is the linear difference between the activity of each unit and a target function. And the matrix of connectivity, or the entire matrix, is updated at every time step. Now, in the examples that I will show you, we're building models that are as big as the size of the experimental data set. And so we're building networks that are about 10,000 units big and spread between 1 to 13 different regions in the larval zebrafish. So what do we get from these models, right? What have we done so far? We've built multi-region RNNs by wiring multiple recurrent neural networks together with feedback and feedforward connections. And we're, we've trained the model units within these networks to match calcium data directly. So what we get from them, once we're done, is threefold. We get a multi-region RNN that, once it's trained, produces realistic neural dynamics, which in and of itself is not that surprising, because those of you who've played with networks like this know that they're quite powerful. What is surprising is the ability to infer from them consistent brain-wide interactions through these trained connectivity matrices, which I'm symbolizing here by J trained. And that's not something you could have gotten from measurements alone. The third thing you get, which is actually something that we're quite excited about and I'll tell you about in a second, is actually the product of the first two. So if you recall the equation that you saw before, the dot product of the j with the phi's gives us currents, right? So the currents due to recurrence both within and between areas is really the most powerful thing we can get from these networks. And I'll show you exactly how each of these things is, um, e each of these things works. So let's look at these results. So what we want to do is to be able to answer the question, is there a cortex in the larval zebrafish that is able to shut down the movement? And so to keep things simple, I want to show you results from a three-region RNN model. So one of these regions is going to be modeled by an RNN that is Habenula-like, one that is Raphael-like, which is what you see in the blue and red schematics here. And the third region I'm going to introduce is one that is conveniently named the telencephalon. I mean, where else were we going to look for a cortex that shuts down the movement? And this is where they are in the brain of the larval zebrafish. And here's a schematic showing you these three regions. So once again, I've built three RNNs, connected them reciprocally, and I'm training each of the units to match the data directly from those three regions, respectively. And networks like this are very powerful. And here's neural activity from the network plotted over the data as a function of time. So in blue, you see the Habenula-like RNN unit plotted as a function of time. In red, a Raphael-like RNN unit. And in yellow, Telencephalon-like RNN unit. And in gray, in all three, is the data that was a target function for that particular unit. And just to convince you that I'm not picking the three best neurons that fit, we can also look at the same state space view that we developed in the, in, the first, um, in the first half of this lecture and project the activity of this entire three region network onto the dominant principal components. In black is the data and in red is the model. And you can see, yes, the model misses a few of the few of the idiosyncrasies that are present in the biological data, but gets the general trend right. Now, really, the strength of these models, as I told you, was to be able to infer connectivity changes by looking at these recurrent interactions. So the thing that the regions that we were really interested in were the Habenula and the Raffae, because those were guided by the experimental results in which we had seen before that the Habenula ramped its activity up and the Raffae ramped its activity down. So we wanted to keep our analysis of these connectivity changes to those two sub-matrices to see what happened. So yes, we can get activity that looks a lot like experimental data. However, the real strength of models like this is our ability to infer from them consistent connectivity matrices or changes to recurrent interactions that reveal stru possibly structural changes underlying the dynamics.
And so the first thing we observed by looking at the log probability density as a function of interaction strengths, and in gray you see the control fish, and in blue you see the um, interaction matrices derived from RNNs that have been trained to match data from shocked fish, is that there was an overall enhancement in the strength of these matrices. So the, you know, because these matrices are centered at zero, a uh, broadening in meant that they were you know, becoming stronger interactions. And so the first thing we wanted to do was to look at interactions within key submatrices. And since we were guided by our experimental intuition to look for changes within the Habenula as well as um, the Raffae and interactions going back and forth between those two regions, we looked inside those. And when we looked at within Habenula, we saw that indeed there were interactions that got stronger. There were huge changes in looking at projections from the Habenula to the Raffae or within the Raffae, but the unexpected, the unexpected finding that came out of networks like this was looking in the Raffae to Habenula projection. And we saw an unexpected increase in the strength of projections going from the Raffae to the Habenula. And it isn't exactly known if there is an anatomical feedback connection going from the Raffae to the Habenula. So this is an unexpected effect that we saw in the connectivity matrices that we're currently exploring. But remember, I was telling you that the product of these two objects, right? We can look at the properties of these J matrices and the submatrices, and we can look at activations. But really, the strength is being able to look at the product of those two and looking at currents due to recurrence from within or different areas. And that's where we developed this technique called current-based decomposition, or curbed for short. So what current-based decomposition, or curbed for short, is able to do is to decompose the activity that was collected by our experimental collaborators in the Habenula into the source currents, which in the three-region model is Habenula to Habenula currents, the Raffae to Habenula currents, or currents experienced by Habenula neurons by projections from the telencephalon. The sum of these three, because it's a linear decomposition, still adds up to make up the activity that experimentalists collect in the Habenula. But these are because of, we we're able to infer these directed interactions or recurrent interaction matrices and decompose them into the source currents, we're able to extract within area currents as well as two inter area currents. Now remember, we're able to do this brain wide. Now, the currents due to recurrent inputs into the Habenula add up to the measured output, which you can see here. I'm plotting the activity that was collected in the Habenula as a function of time, or the average population activity that is shown in the blue to ramp up above that of the control fish in black. Now, the other thing we can do in this current space is to be able to look at the state space view in the current space. So what we've done here is to, is to make up an make up a set of coordinates by looking at the first principal component of the Habenula to Habenula current in blue, the Raffae to Habenula current in red, and the telencephalon to Habenula current in yellow. So when we project the activity of the Habenula into this, into this new coordinate space, we get a surprising effect. So in gray, you see, is the activity of the Habenula plotted into this new coordinate space. I've placed dots on this trajectory to indicate the times at which shocks arrive into the fish. And so in early, the early shocks are in warm colors and late shocks are in cold colors. What we went in expecting to see was ramping activity in the Habenula Habenula subspace. Instead, what we saw was that it, early effects are mediated by currents in the Raffae to Habenula subspace. And it's only later on that the Habenula Habenula as well as the telencephalon to Habenula subspace get populated. Now we can also look at the state space view as a function of time, but this is to tell you that looking at currents in this, in this view can reveal unexpected effects, in this case timing. So what we're trying to say is that this inter-area effects that are derived by looking at these current-based decomposition view is a powerful alternative to the traditional point of view. Well, we can naturally do the obvious, which is to correlate early changes, that is, the current rotations in the Raffae to Habenula subspace, with the behavior 
or in other words, the enhancement of the tail whips as a function of time in the shocked fish at the onset of the behavioral stress. And it's only later on, maybe, that the passive coping is mediated by these other two source currents. But it's a, it's, an, it's a point of view that is not exactly revealed when you look at the raw activity of the habenula, even when you sort it as a function of time, or average over the population activity as a function of time, or indeed take the raw activity and project it into the state space view. The, the unexpected timing effect of the raffe to habenula currents mediating the active coping phase of this behavior was only revealed when we were able to do this current-based decomposition. Now, we can also look at these currents as a function of time, and that's what I'm showing you here. We've taken the tail whips and we've convolved them with a Gaussian to give our eyes something to look at. And here is uh, data from applying current-based decomposition uh, from RNN outputs that have been trained to match data from a control fish which wasn't experiencing any shocks. And you can see that that fish kind of waggles its tail every once in a while as a function of time. And in red is the raffid to habenula current, in blue is the habenula habenula current, and in yellow is the telencephalon to habenula current. And aside from a small difference in magnitude, they don't seem to be doing anything different relative to one another. However, when you look at the same traces over time for a shocked fish, once again, this is a shocked fish, so you can see that over time, it waggles its tail less and lapses into passivity somewhere in the middle of this trial. This is not even a particularly good shocked fish because it does make an exploratory tail movement later. But this highlights the effect I was telling you before, which is that the active coping phase, or early in the experiment, the raffe to habenula current seems to ramp up first. And it's only later, after this particular fish has lapsed into passivity, as you can see from the tail whips going to zero, that the habenula habenula and the telencephalon to habenula current start to ramp up. Now, this effect holds even when we're looking across individuals. So these have been averaged over five different RNN implementations of different individuals. And once again, you can see that even averaged over multiple individuals, the early effect or the active coping phase seems to be mediated by the raffe to habenula currents. Now, to really convince you that there are two distinct timescales occurring here, I also need to look at the relevant submatrix. And that's what we do here. So on the, the second half of the slide is exactly the same as what you saw before, except now in the top of the slide, I show you the changes to the recurrent interactions within the raffe to habenular submatrix in this, um, from this RNN. So you see prob log probability density as a function of interaction strength. In black is the baseline period, and in red, the histogram shows the initial phase or early in the experiment. And you see that in this particular fish, there isn't that much of a difference between the baseline and the early part of the experiment. And it's only later on, which is indicated by the expansion in the range of the blue histogram, that there are changes to the structural difference between the raffid to the habenular projection. So what we're saying here is that there are two different mechanisms at play in mediating the transition from active to passive coping in the larval zebrafish. So taken together, what do our results show? So in 2019, we showed that the habenular interactions ramp with persistent and inescapable adversity. And looking at, these co at the connectivity or recurrent interactions from RNNs that have been fit to this data showed that there were unexpected feedback interactions from the raffe to the habenula. What we're now developing is this current-based decomposition method which can reveal unexpected effects, such as differential roles of the raffe and telencephalon projections into the habenula. Some of those changes are driven by fast rotations to the current manifold, and some of them may be mediated by slower changes and manifest themselves in looking at these types of recurrent interactions brain-wide.
And so when we're talking about looking at circuit mechanisms that are conserved as well as identifying where key divergences occur, we're currently taking this type of data-constrained RNN approach and trying to expand it to a variety of different nervous systems. So we have learned a lot today, right? In the first lecture, we saw some of the foundational elements of what goes into recurrent neural network models, what the vocabulary is, what are the properties of specific types of recurrent neural network models, and how we can get you know, dynamically rich patterns of activity from them. In the second lecture, we saw how RNNs have been applied profitably for mechanistic discovery in neuroscience. And that involved looking at training algorithms, and that involved, a through a few examples, including an in-depth dive into an example from my own lab, how reverse engineering recurrent neural network models may give us ideas about mechanisms that are inaccessible from experiments alone. And so with that, I would like to conclude and uh, thank you all for your attention. I would like to thank my colleagues in the lab who've helped um, enormously with development of this, um, of this tutorial. I'd like to thank the digital strategy design, me, uh, design team. I would like to thank um, Eve Marder, Meher Dodd, Meming Park, and Larry Abbott for their helpful comments on the contents of this lecture. I'd like to take a moment and thank the COSIGN program committee and chairs and the tutorial chair, for giving me this opportunity, and our fearless team of TAs, and I hope you've gotten to know them a little bit during the first hands-on session, and you'll get to know them a lot in the second one as well. You would have seen uh, their names um, flash before you in various slides, and that's because each of them is a domain expert in some of the stuff that I've talked to you about today. I would like to take a second and thank my funding sources for their faith in our ideas. Thank you.